If you study the sky in a planetarium, you can be pretty certain that any of your questions can be answered. But if you observe the real night sky, there is a chance that you may see something moving that you don't recognize. A UFO, an unidentified flying object. And for the untrained observer, it is easy to be fooled, and there's usually some simple explanation. But as you've just seen, even for people who are used to watching the sky, there are some things that defy explanation. Hello, I'm Peter Coyote, and in the movie E.T., I play a UFO investigator who, like myself, has always wanted to have a UFO experience. I think that many people are fascinated by the possibility that UFOs might be spacecraft piloted by intelligent beings. In my case, it's a curiosity that's existed for more than 30 years. But the real question is, is there any validity to the UFO experience? Anything beyond just our wishful thinking? About 90% of the objects that are reported as UFOs are explainable. Usually they turn out to be celestial bodies or military and civilian aircraft. And a certain number of them are hoaxes, like this one and this one. To the skeptics, 35 years of investigations have failed to turn up any evidence that UFOs really exist. One of the leading critics is aviation writer Philip Klass. We've had tens of thousands of UFO reports, yet there is not a single, not a single photograph of an extraordinary craft-like object that cannot be explained as a hoax or in other prosaic terms. There is not a single physical artifact, not a residue, that would say something extraordinary is underway. Then are UFOs just part of our modern mythology, reflected in Hollywood films? All through history, mankind has always looked to the skies for help. In times of tension, they've always looked to the skies. And today, where, when we have the possible, the fear of nuclear holocaust, of overpopulation, of pollution, of the energy crisis. My gosh, what's more natural for the people then to say, wouldn't it be nice if some intelligence could come in from above and help us out with all this stuff? Astronomer Alan Hynek has been studying UFOs for over 30 years now, and he's convinced that there's nothing fictional about them. Starting as a complete skeptic, I underwent a transformation, and now I've simply, um, it's, I guess the best way of saying it is it's an itch that I just have to scratch. It's, it's um, there and it, I feel that we have a phenomenon that is, uh, could be of tremendous potential importance to the human race. I, I feel that strongly about it. So who is right? The believer or the skeptic? In a moment, we'll look at the evidence for some answers. Unidentified flying object, that's what people reported seeing on March of 1982, circling the sky over San Francisco. At least a half dozen people say they saw a UFO near the Golden Gate Bridge this morning. A cluster of lights was first spotted by one commuter crossing the bridge just after 6 a.m. It looked neon, and uh, it was just kind of hovering, and it looked like a big white wing, you know, to me. Each year, hundreds of people claim to see UFOs. Most are eventually identified. This particular object turned out to be an advertising plane, which is frequently mistaken for a UFO. When people do see things in the sky that mystify them, who can they turn to? Publicly, government agencies claim no interest in UFO sightings. This leaves a few small private organizations the task of investigating the literally hundreds of UFO sightings every year. These organizations are small and have tiny budgets and are staffed by volunteers who must investigate these eyewitness reports in their spare time. Tom Page is a high school astronomy teacher in Northern California. On weekends and whenever time allows, he's a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, one of the largest groups in the country. 
One of his more recent cases involves a young pilot from Novato, California. Shannon Davis is a flight instructor who has logged over 3,000 hours in the air, 600 of those at night. His sighting on the night of November 5, 1980 is typical of the 5 to 10 percent that remain unidentified. I noticed the light off of my left wing at about the 7 o'clock position of the airplane. And because I was in radar contact with Oakland Center because of the IFR flight, I asked them how close that aircraft was from us, and they said that they didn't show anything on radar out there. Then I noticed that it pulled up alongside my left wing. It was a bullet shape rounded at the front that widened out and then tapered to a point at the end. But one of the things I really wondered about it is around the main body, the center, but just past the nose, there was a ring spinning around it. And it did a couple of things simultaneously. What happened is the pulsation quickened up on the nose, and the whole thing went to a very bright color. At the same time, the ring seemed to spin faster till that whole ring disappeared. And with a matter of seconds, the brightness of the object appeared to be just like a glowing bright fireball. And I kind of jumped because at first I was, I guess I was thinking of some kind of missile that was detonating. And the thing took off forward and it shot out to forward of the nose. I estimated about two or three miles ahead of the aircraft. And it made an instantaneous 90 degree right angle turn and it went vertical until it went up out of sight. And I sat there looking at it and I didn't know what to think. Five minutes later, Shannon saw the object again and it repeated the same pattern. Only this time, two pilots flying in the opposite direction also saw the UFO. I have to, to best of my knowledge, rule out any kind of meteor or shooting star because I don't know if any meteor that will come alongside, pace you, and then take off forward and go vertical. Okay? Uh, any kind of spacecraft or military aircraft, technically that was defying all physical laws by making an instantaneous 90 degree turn. According to the laws of physics, that can't be done. And, you know, I watched it do it twice. The first step in any UFO investigation is to check out witness credibility. In this particular case, it was easy since Tom already knew Shannon. I first met Shannon Davis as a student in one of my classes. As far as the credibility of the witness in this case, I feel that this particular individual is telling the truth. I think he's a very truthful individual. Uh, he had no reason to lie. And uh, at the time, he didn't want any publicity. Now he said that he would be willing to make this public just for scientific information. But one witness does not make a strong case, so Tom tried to locate the other two pilots. There's a possibility in this particular setting that there were two other witnesses, two pilots who saw something come out of an overcast above Shannon. Uh, I do not know what airline they were from, and Shannon didn't either, and we were unable to contact them. And what about radar? During the encounter, Shannon radioed Oakland Center Flight Facility, but their response was negative. If a pilot were to inform us that he had a sighting of a UFO in close proximity, we would not be able to distinguish between he and that UFO. It would be all one target to us. Could the object have been man-made or a natural phenomenon? None of those things could do the things that this particular object did, moving forward at a high speed, making a right-angle turn. Uh, possibly a military aircraft could, but the military certainly wouldn't be telling us about it. The case closed. This is how the evidence stood. Was the main witness credible? Yes. Were other eyewitnesses contacted to support the story? No. Was the object tracked on radar? No. Could the object have been man-made or some celestial body? Inconclusive. That's the problem we have, is that we're basing the whole UFO study on uh, the report of witnesses, and we have to just determine whether these witnesses are telling the truth or not. Shannon believes he saw something extraordinary, and Page agrees with him. But to the doubters, without hard evidence, they are inclined toward a more conventional explanation. There are dozens, simply dozens of things to be seen in the night skies. And I say to any of your viewers, if they will go out tonight, if it's a clear night, and spend three hours looking at the night skies, I can almost guarantee them they will see something that will surprise them, something unusual. But ufologists like Page argue that the problem is not the validity of the eyewitness accounts, but the lack of professionally trained, full-time people to investigate cases like Shannon's. 
look, we wouldn't have gone to the moon if we'd had to depend on people who could work only on weekends and without salary as a hobby. Uh, the, what we need in ufology is to make it professional. Not all UFO investigators are amateurs. There are professionals and many with scientific backgrounds who are conducting diligent studies. Their efforts have brought UFO research out of the realm of fantasy into a brighter, more realistic light. In the last 40 years, technology has moved us from an earthbound existence straight into the outer reaches of space. And now, that technological know-how is being used to try and unravel the UFO mystery. John Schusler is a mechanical engineer for McDonnell Douglas and NASA. Here at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Schusler has worked on several space programs, including Skylab and the Space Shuttle. Schusler's lifelong interest in UFOs prompted him to bring together other interested aerospace workers and form a group called VISIT. Our project VISIT is a very unique organization in that uh, our acronym stands for Vehicle Internal Systems Investigative Team. And by that we mean that UFOs, if they exist, must have internal systems, as do our spacecraft, such as the space shuttle. We feel that by investigating cases where there are unique attributes and that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge materials, metals, photographs, anything technological that we can take the end result and model it, backtrack and define, define and design exactly what happened. Over the past several months, Schusler and his group have accumulated a file of a hundred cases of UFO encounters in which people were injured. One of the most intriguing cases that Schusler and his group are investigating involves these women, Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and Vicki's grandson, Colby. In December of 1980, the three of them encountered an unusual object on the outskirts of Houston. We had been driving out this country road, which it is a very desolate area, and all of a sudden, we've seen this object so I didn't know whether to stop, to back up, keep going, or what. So we just kept driving. We thought, well, maybe it's, it's an air balloon or something, you know, weather balloon or something. But the closer we got, we could tell that either it was going to be us or it, because it kept getting lower and getting hotter. And uh, this object come down almost to the treetops, almost ahead of us. And I screamed for Betty to stop. And I think if she hadn't stopped and we went on under it, we would have burned up. I got out in the car, Kobe and me, for about, I guess, a minute or two. And he was screaming like he was trying to get away from me and then pulling me back in the car and I got back in the car and Betty walked to the head of the car. I thought it was the end of time because I've always been taught the Bible says the world will be destroyed by fire, hell and brimstone. Well, how did I know that the hell and brimstone wasn't right there with it? And as hot as it was, if hell is any hotter, God forbid, I want to live a good life. Because it was just, it was just almost unbearable. I kept trying to calm Kobe, and I couldn't. I had to tell him something that would calm him. And I said, if you see this big man come out of it, it'd be Jesus. Well, I just had a feeling to look up in the sky. I looked around a little bit more and I saw that object. It looked like a diamond. It lit up the whole sky. 
It was a grayish metallic looking color. But yet the flames that was throwing out was a reddish, yellowish looking glow. Besides the strange object, they all claim to have seen several helicopters hovering around it. Just about the minute that I got up close enough to really make the shape of the object, whatever it is, the helicopters were there. We was amazed at, you know, what kind of helicopters there were. We were about scared to death, the double rotary kind of helicopters. I never saw one before. Whatever they saw that night, the physical impact was immediate. Within hours, they were suffering from severe headaches, diarrhea, and vomiting. Betty Cash had the worst symptoms. Her main problem at that time was severe headache, uh, swelling of the face, swelling of the eyelids, and the swelling of the skull, that is the, the top of the head. The fear of ridicule kept Betty from telling about her UFO encounter. But weeks later, when patches of her hair started falling out, she told her doctor about the incident. Specialists were brought in, including a dermatologist and a radiologist, to run tests. They all turned up negative. John Schusler and his group started their own investigation several months later. Despite the inconclusive medical reports, Schusler believes that all three victims received some kind of radiation exposure caused by the UFO. It's a package of symptoms that all three had, and all three being different kinds of people. That's the significant thing. From their age, their the past history, medical history, etc. But they all had common symptoms. The common symptoms all manifested themselves right after the incident, starting within hours. And what about the helicopters that were supposedly hovering around the object? Schusler's investigators found other witnesses who saw them. Now, the helicopters must have been military if they existed. That has to be a given. There are no civilian operations of CH-47 Chinook-type helicopters in the Houston or Gulf Coast area. Major Dennis Hare is a commander with the National Guard at Ellington Air Force Base near Houston. He says none of the Chinooks in his unit flew the night of the incident. I personally was not up in the air that night, and, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, uh, no member of my unit or, or the aircraft that's under my command were up in the air on that particular date. A fleet of helicopters, an unidentified flying object, and three victims who were injured by it. What do they all add up to? No one is sure. Schusler and his group think that one possible explanation is that our government may have been testing a secret aircraft that night powered by some type of microwave propulsion system. The craft may have gone out of control, almost touching down when Betty, Vicky, and Colby saw it. They have what would normally be seen from a heavy dose of microwave and possibly uh, an X-ray component. And we do know that pulsed microwave gives off an X-ray component. But if the military is involved, they deny it. Citizens of the United States were subjected to chemical exposures, radiation exposures, and various other things over the past 30 years at different times in the interest of research or military operations. And a lot of those people kept saying, hey, look, I was hurt. Believe me, I was hurt. And everybody said, you're crazy. It couldn't have happened. As for Betty and Vicki, they still suffer from hypersensitivity to heat. I do expect them to take care of my medical bills and what I have had to go through with, and what I'm still going through with, and what I may have to continue for years. I don't believe in the little green men and all of that stuff from outer space. But if it's some, I, something that people don't know about, and it slipped in here and did that to us, and the government say, yet say they don't know about it, when they had the helicopters up there, we in a terrible shape because if it can happen to us it could happen to a whole city a postscript to the case vicky and betty have filed suit against the federal government attempting to win compensation for their injuries they remain firmly convinced that whatever it was they saw it was attached to the united states military after pressure from a texas congressman the u.s air force sent its own special investigator to look into the matter his report states that he was unable to find any connection whatsoever between the UFO and any branch of the U.S. military. 
And so the case remains unsolved, but it does raise some questions. Is it possible that some unidentified flying objects could be secret U.S. military test planes? And if so, what recourse do citizens have if they are injured by them? Under deep regressive hypnosis, Carol Del Duca is recounting a bizarre story in which she was whisked away in a spaceship. Her husband Joseph, also under hypnosis, tells the same story. Is it real or imagined? In the whole area of UFO experiences, the strangest and most controversial are the abduction cases. Since the early 1970s, there have been well over 300 incidents of people claiming to have been forcibly abducted and taken onto spaceships where they met extraterrestrial beings. These incredible stories have divided UFO investigators. Our own examination of this began with Joseph and Carol Del Duca's own story. The Del Duca case was investigated by Dr. Richard Sigismund, a social psychologist in Boulder, Colorado. Their story begins late one night while driving down a lonely stretch of highway on their way home from a trip with their four-month-old son. All they can remember is seeing four UFOs. Only under deep hypnosis do they begin to fill in the lost hours. Four. Five. Sleep. Joe and Carol are each hypnotized separately but relate similar stories. You're pulling into where? The woods. What are you doing there? We're going to the spaceship. Going to a what? A spaceship. Tell me what you're doing then. Joe and Carol talk about undergoing some kind of physical examination. They're looking at my feet. They're looking at your feet, you said? Yes. It's hurting me. What'd you say, Carol? It's all right to tell me, Carol. Broken. There's people. Would you describe these people to me, Joe? Tell me what you see. Tell me what they're doing, if anything. They got little ribs all up and down. They're real skinny at the waist, but they have a big chest. It's clear that Joe and Carol are reliving an intensely emotional experience, especially Joe, who describes an unusual meeting with one of the entities. He just pulled me out. Pulled you out of what, Joe? Out of my body. I'm one, but I'm two. He's so nice. 
is born. And he likes me. Were Joe and Carol abducted by aliens from another world, or did they imagine it? Dr. Sigismund believes it did happen. The stories on every significant, in fact, minor details, they match. Uh, even though each individual had distinctly uh, different uh, type of experience, which they relived under the hypnosis. Nonetheless, if they were describing the shape of the so-called craft, or they're describing the suits of the entities, uh, it all dovetailed uh, to a minute degree. It would be a great difficulty if individuals sought to perpetrate a hoax to maintain it under deep hypnosis. We sometimes doubted ourselves. Did that really happen? That's incredible. But after we realized that this was a good thing, and very few people have the privilege of getting to do something like that, that it had a good it left us with good feelings. It was just mind-boggling. But uh, there was a lasting impact. But the theory of abductions is being challenged by this team of investigators. Dr. Alvin Lawson, an English professor at Long Beach State University, Dr. William McCall, a medical doctor who specializes in hypnotism, and John Herrera, a writer. They demonstrated for us a basic experiment. And that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge she was abducted. And the volunteer who is told to imagine an abduction. The result? Both stories are similar. What is it that you're seeing? The shapes. And they're looking down at me. They're tall and slim. with large eyes, long fingers. It's like this bright light in their heads looking down at me there. Um, but they're like shadows. Mm -hmm. And something's passing across. Yes. It's sort of like a piece of something. They're looking into my eyes. There's no communication that they know what I'm thinking. Uh, no verbal communication. It's like they're bleeping something at me, like... like electrical impulses or something. In general, the imaginary and the real experiences as we've experienced them here uh, are identical. I mean, there are no real substantive differences. All of these indicate to me that, and to my colleagues, I'm sure, that the imaginary, or that the abduction narratives aren't real physical experiences. That is, there are not aliens coming here. And uh, they indicate, however, that the people believe that something might well have happened to them. This is what's so fascinating. I think something quite real in psychological terms is happening to these people. I don't think little green men are doing it. I think we're doing it, or the mind is doing it to us. Experiments by Lawson, McCall, and others seem to prove that abductions are essentially psychological. This does not invalidate them, however, and they are still happening to people all over the world. It's up to the researchers to find out why. Guatemala City, 1976. A TV crew is shooting a commercial when they suddenly spot something strange flying overhead. To this day, no one has been able to identify it. But as spectacular as it appears, this videotape and other forms of pictorial evidence have only limited value in our understanding of UFOs. 
Richard Haynes is a research scientist who has studied many photographs. In order to make sense out of photographic evidence, it's extremely important to know a great deal about the photographer, about the camera system he uses, about the development process that is used, and in general about the context in which the picture was taken. Oftentimes, we come across photographic evidence long after the fact, and because of that, we don't have much of that fine detail information that we need to do a, a good systematic analysis. But with the development of sophisticated image enhancement equipment, investigators can gain new information from photographs. Haynes demonstrated how this can be done by analyzing this particular photograph. The picture of a tiny object trailing a plane has long been considered by ufologists to be a good example of photographic evidence of a UFO. But skeptics claim the object is really something on the ground. To try to settle the question, Haynes had the photograph put through a process called color enhancement. This gives the picture more detail, allowing Haynes to do a more extensive analysis. What our uh, analysis has just shown of the digitization of this photograph is that the darkness of this major disc-shaped image right here is uh, very close to the same darkness as the tail structure here of the airplane, the wing tank, and the main body. And we find that there's no objects on the ground at that equivalent range with the equivalent darkness. Now, what this suggests then is that in fact it's an airborne object. But even faux enhancement equipment has its limits. In the final analysis, however, we're stuck with an image of something we don't understand. If that enhancement process shows the image to be an airplane outline, we're home free. But on the other hand, if it shows a uh, symmetrical airform, uh, an oblate spheroid, for instance, with no uh, means of propulsion or support or lift, we're right back where we started, you see. So photographic analysis must be coupled with a very creative approach on the part of the photo interpreter. So without additional evidence, photographs of UFOs really prove nothing at all. But when there is additional evidence, UFOlogists believe that they can make a strong case. And right now, we look at one of their strongest. No other pictorial evidence has created as much interest as these images shot from an airplane during the early morning hours of December 31st, 1978. This is the New Zealand film, considered by most experts to be the single strongest evidence of a UFO ever captured on film. To most of us, it may not seem impressive, a small bright light in the night sky off the New Zealand coast. But it is the only case of a UFO that was seen by several pilots and crew members, picked up on radar and photographed on several thousand frames of 16 millimeter color film shot by a TV crew. It appears to have a brightly lit bottom and a transparent sort of sphere on top. So it appears to be, well, like a, a flying saucer. No one has studied the New Zealand film more than this man. Bruce Maccabee is a physicist who spent over a year analyzing the film. Now, my claim is that having looked at the film and the whole sighting in general, that the film shows objects which cannot be identified by conventional means. To arrive at that conclusion, Maccabee first flew the same route in which the sightings were made. He set out to disprove one of the first conventional explanations offered that the object was a celestial body, like Venus. The lights that they were talking about was below the level of that mountain range. In other words, silhouetted against the mountain range, if you wish, rather than above the mountain range. So uh, I, I, I don't see any celestial body that could have done that. Also, if you look at the image carefully, you will see it does strange things, like when it, when it tends to fade out, it changes its shape from being sort of oval to sort of thin in a vertical direction, and then just fades out. Other skeptics suggested that the light came from squid boats, which use bright lights to draw squid to the water surface. To eliminate that possibility, Maccabee made a direct comparison between a squid boat light and the light in the film. The squid boat picture clearly shows a reflection in the water extending underneath the image of the squid boat, sort of a dull reddish triangular reflection extending downwards. In none of the images in this uh, UFO film 
have I been able to find any indication of a reflection in the water, which you would expect if it's a squid boat. According to air controllers, their radar picked up the object and estimated the distance to the airplane at between 10 to 20 miles. Using a densitometer, an instrument that measures film density, Maccabee was able to determine the object's brightness. If the light source had been, for example, 10 nautical miles away, then it was putting out a power equivalent to several hundred thousand watts worth of incandescent light bulbs. A several hundred thousand watt source is not a small uh, amount of power. <laughs> that's an that's a awful lot of uh, energy being used up, and they saw this thing for 15 minutes, so uh, it must have been a considerable source of power by itself. But the most amazing conclusion that Maccabee reached centered on these last few feet of film, shown here in extremely slow motion. It shows the object flashing from bright white to a dim red and then orange color. The periodicity of this flashing is uh, essentially perfect for 30 cycles. Now, such a regular flashing of a light implies intelligent control. We could find no human-made light source to account for it. So uh, the periodicity suggests intelligence, and yet we can't find any conventional explanation. Uh, so that suggests that we have some sort of an intelligence on our hands here, and uh, that removes it being, you know, beyond the pale of science, I'm afraid. No one has yet been able to refute any of Maccabee's work. He believes that the significance of the New Zealand film goes far beyond the scope of just one case. The hard evidence left over in this case suggests we have something which cannot be explained in conventional terms, and that opens up a new field of investigation in science. Uh, it, it suggests that we should go back and rethink what we've been saying about other UFO cases. October 25th, 1975. Fighter planes are sent in hot pursuit after an unidentified flying object seen hovering over missile sites at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. NORAD, the North American Air Defense, reports that the jets failed to intercept the object. For the next two months, NORAD recorded other sightings of UFOs over missile launching sites and nuclear weapons storage areas in Michigan, Maine, and North Dakota. In all cases, our jets were unable to overtake the objects. The 1975 sightings show us dramatically that unidentified flying objects have invaded our airspace. And yet, since 1969, the federal government's position has been that it is not interested in investigating UFOs. It was in 1969 that the Air Force ended Project Blue Book, a 21-year investigation of UFOs. Their basic conclusion was that lack of evidence warranted no further study of the matter. There was no evidence of uh, threat to national security. Uh, there was no evidence that we had been visited by extraterrestrial vehicles. And uh, finally, there was no uh, evidence that uh, after evaluating these uh, UFO sightings that there was any indication of scientific knowledge, the existence of scientific knowledge beyond the present state of, of knowledge. But government documents on the NORAD incidents, as well as thousands of other reports, reveal that the government continues to investigate a phenomenon that is much more than just a few isolated incidents. Since 1969, as many as 10 governmental agencies have been involved in UFO inquiries, including the CIA, the FBI, the National Security Agency, and the Air Force. Attorney Peter Gersten has led the fight to unearth these documents on behalf of a group called Citizens Against UFO Secrecy. The documents confirm the reality of these unconventional objects, and there is furthermore evidence that uh, these objects exhibit a technology that is beyond present-day technology, an advanced technology, a more sophisticated technology. A graphic example of that technology was reported in this document about an incident on September 19, 1976 in Iran. 
An F-4 jet, similar to this one, was sent to intercept unusual objects seen over the city of Tehran. As the F-4 approached the brilliant object, the jet lost all instrumentation and communication. Later, when the jet tried to shoot a missile at a second object, the F-4's weapon control panel went dead. What makes this incident uh, interesting and significant is that it involves the malfunction of an American-made defensive tactical weapon system, uh, specifically uh, an F-4 jet. The interesting part of, of the incident is that the Defense Intelligence Agency did an evaluation of the incident and found the incident to be a classic UFO case because of eyewitness uh, verification uh, confirmed by radar and, and so forth. Documents show repeatedly that UFOs have been able to penetrate our military airspace. In one incident in 1980, UFOs were seen over Kirkland Air Force Base in New Mexico. The base is a highly sensitive installation that includes an advanced weapons research laboratory. Documents show that bright objects were able to land at the base undetected by radar. When security police tried to pursue the objects, they took off. UFOs pose a threat to national security for many reasons, the first of which relate to the general principle that these objects have been unable to be identified by this government for the last 35 years. Another reason we see in the documents, which relate to the overflights over the military bases in 1975, uh, the unrestricted and unlimited access that these objects had. But Gersten and his group have been stopped in their pursuit of more information. The CIA refused to send Gersten 57 documents, and the Air Force has 100 documents that it refused to release. And recently, the National Security Agency did not release 160 documents for the same reason, national security. And in May of this year... And that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge... ...would be both embarrassing to the agency, because it would show, once again, that the objects exist, that the ob objects are an advanced technology, and the objects do, in one way or another, pose a threat. So they don't want to release the information for that reason. How much should the public be told about our government's investigations of UFOs? It's true that some information pertains to national defense and should be classified. But what about other information? What's needed now are not more secrecy-shrouded investigations but a joint effort between government and scientists dedicated to unraveling the UFO mystery. Because it's obvious that Project Blue Book was not the last word on the subject. astronomers would agree that it is likely that there are other civilizations in our galaxy but most astronomers doubt that we have been visited by aliens you see no other civilization could know in advance that we exist because our only means of telling them about us are by radio waves that we broadcast into space and we've only been doing that half a century which means there's a big sphere of radio radiation expanding outward at the speed of light that's how fast radio waves go now about 50 light years in radius. And even with the most optimistic guesses, the most likely nearest civilization is many times further away than that. So any inter, uh, extraterrestrial spaceships visiting Earth would have to have been cruising around sort of at random, looking in, in space in general. And if you work out the numbers, it turns out you'd have to suppose that every conceivable civilization that could exist would be launching ships at the rate of one every few seconds to account for the number of reports of UFOs that are made here on the Earth. If not aliens, then what do UFOs represent? For scientists like Abel, the answer is very little, if anything.
I think it's fair to say that uh, members of the scientific community would be extremely delighted to investigate UFOs very seriously if there was anything concrete to investigate. The difficulty is, the more you look into it, the more you find the evidence is hearsay or, or slipshod evidence or, or um, things which we can very well understand without the need to investigate. I can appreciate the uh, desire of the physical scientists, the so-called hard scientists, to have what they call hard data. I would like it too. But when you have a phenomenon that doesn't seem to produce the hard data, uh, one might ask, might as well have asked Freud, Sigmund Freud, what is the hard data in dream analysis? What do you take in the laboratory? What do you put under a microscope in dream analysis? And yet we have the whole structure of psychoanalysis today. And so we've come full circle around the subject of UFOs, and it's a standoff between those who believe and those who don't. But it seems to me that UFOlogists have a strong case when they argue for a serious investigation of the phenomenon. Because scientists who dismiss UFOs are either unwilling or unable to refute the most outstanding cases, like the New Zealand film. If documents show that sightings over military installations are taken seriously by our government, shouldn't that be investigated? If a videotape shows an object that defies identification, shouldn't it be analyzed? And if people believe they were abducted by aliens from outer space, isn't that a subject that merits psychological study? Dr. Haynes and others say yes, and they make a plea for time and money to do a thorough investigation of the strongest UFO cases. But even more important, they want their fellow scientists to keep an open mind. Because we're dealing with a phenomenon we don't understand. And because of that, we need to keep every avenue open in terms of, of the approach taken to understand it. It might take physics, uh, some breakthrough in, in molecular physics, let's say, or plasma physics. It might take some uh, understandings of the psyche, uh, of the unconscious. It might take a combination of the two. It might take some totally new field of science we don't have yet. Ufology today is in the state, I would say, that, say, chemistry was when chemistry was alchemy, a mixture of superstition, wild ideas, unproved claims, and yet out of that whole mess, finally the very first class science of chemistry evolved. And I think the same thing is going to happen eventually with ufology. It's, but the, right now, it is a mess. There's a fantastic amount of wishful thinking, of desire, of pseudoscience, of pseudo-religion, of cultism. But eventually, I think that will all finally sink to the bottom and we'll have, uh, out of that whole thing, a, a clear liquid of, of something that we can really see and I hope understand. It doesn't seem likely that the government will join with scientists in a complete public investigation of the UFO phenomenon. And this leaves the job to be done by the Alan Hynecks and the Richard Haineses and the hundreds of investigators all over the world struggling against all odds to make some sense of the UFO experience.